Hey folks, David Stewart here. It's time to talk a little bit more about music theory. Last time in the first part of the series, this is part two, um, I talked about the nature of music and I gave a really, really big grand declaration um, for what music is. I say what we perceive music, what we perceive as music, is our neurology, our brain responding to a complex set of relationships between sound frequencies over time, um, a relationship between pitches over time. Um, that's what we perceive music to be. And I gave two terms associated with that, consonants, which you can think of as a close relationship between pitches, and then dissonance, which you can think of as a distant relationship or no relationship between the sounding frequencies. Um, and I want to expand on that idea and dive a little bit more into how the math of music works. And a great entry point to that is the overtone series, otherwise known as the harmonic series, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, this will uh, give you an appreciation of how the mathematics of music works um, on a really, really close look level. Um, the second part of this video, I'll do probably two parts, we're going to pull out some actual numbers and do some math and see how things really line up and possibly talk about some tuning systems, which is also important to know. So what you need to know about the harmonic series is that it's, it's a natural part of the way acoustics work. Um, almost any acoustic instrument that's vibrating at a particular pitch um, is actually not producing just one frequency when it's vibrating, just one note. Um, it's producing a whole field of frequencies, and those frequencies are determined by the overtone series, regardless of what kind of instrument it is. If it's a, if it's a timpani, it has a vibrating membrane, a guitar has a vibrating string, a clarinet has a vibrating column of air. There's something in there that's vibrating that's going to produce this field of pitches. Um, so what you uh, want to think about, or a really, really good way to think about this, I suppose, when you start, is to think about a string. String's really easy to think about this, but we can apply it to anything else. So I want you to imagine you have this string here. And by the way, while I'm drawing this, imagine we got a string. There's our wonderful guitar string. A lot of people have this idea that um, you need to learn music theory on the piano. And while the piano is not a terrible instrument to learn music theory on, uh, you don't have to learn music theory on the piano. And for this lesson, in fact, it's better to have a stringed instrument where you can manipulate the strings rather than a piano where the strings are just sort of uh, set and you can't reach in and manipulate them in the same way as what I'm going to demonstrate. Uh, so the other thing is that the piano only has 12 notes because in the West we use 12 notes. But maybe at the end of this series, uh, you'll kind of understand that that 12 note system is at best a compromise. It doesn't represent the math of sound properly. Um, We'll leave that for another time. But imagine we have a string vibrating. And um, whatever frequencies that that string is going to generate is, a fact, is, a, is determined by a couple things. The length of the string, the amount of tension on the string, and the weight of the string or the, the material that the string is made out of. Um, so if we have a string of length x, um, let's just call it length x. It doesn't really matter how long or short the string is for this theoretical part of the thought. And all that matters is that you understand the relationship. So let's call that, that length X. And in case anybody's wondering, that's an A. It's vibrating at about 110 hertz right now. We'll, we'll do the, the numbers next time. Um, so we have a, a, a string vibrating at length X. The thing about this is that if you were to um, strike this string and you were to look really close with it, like with a high-speed camera, or if you were to get a strobe light and turn off the light so you can actually see some of this as well, You'd see that the string is not vibrating in the normal way that we think sound waves operate. You know, uh, it's vibrating in three dimensions, like um, two girls sort of swinging a big jump rope between each other on a playground. That's what the string's kind of going to look like. It's going to vibrate in an elliptical pattern rather than just up and down, because it exists in three dimensions, right? But something else you'll notice if you were to put a high-speed camera is that it's not just the, the jump rope going in circles. It's also going to start doing some other weird things. You're going to see parts of it vibrating quicker than other parts. And that's because whenever you strike um, a string or you're, you're vibrating a column of air like with a clarinet, um, you're not just having it vibrate along length x. You're having it vibrate on all the fractions of length x as well. So it's, it's not just vibrating on length x. It's also vibrating on length x over 2 halfway. It's also vibrating at length x over 3, which is one third. It's also vibrating at length x over 4, one quarter, one fifth, one sixth, all the way down till the infinite division of fractions that you can imagine, basically infinity. Um, it's vibrating along all those lengths. Now, obviously, as you get smaller and smaller and smaller, um, 
the capacity for that string to vibrate diminishes basically into infinity. So uh, you are talking about kind of like a soft limit, like with a calculus equation or something like that. Um, let me demonstrate how this works with a string. A string is a really, really good way to think about how this works. Um, so I have that string vibrating at 110 hertz. If I touch the string at exactly the midway part, we still have the x over 2 length vibrating. Okay, if I touch it exactly midway, that's going to be 12th fret for you guitar players. Um, what you're going to get is a harmonic that comes out, what, what guitarists would know as a, a harmonic. That's the X over 2 frequency becoming audible. Now what's happening is that you're not actually playing a higher note at all. You're not shortening the length of the string. You're not causing uh, any sort of uh, change in what would fundamentally change the field of frequencies, like changing the length of the string or changing the tension on the string. You're just touching it at halfway, and what happens is that as you touch it at halfway, you're dampening the X length, and you're allowing the X over 2 length to continue vibrating. You're also going to dampen the X over 3 length. So you get this sort of hollow-like sound. We have a full pitch, and then we touch, and then all of a sudden you can hear this pitch emerge. And the thing is, all of these pitches are already there. When this string is vibrating, it's producing all of these different frequencies. It's producing all of these different sound waves. What happens is your neurology hears that field of sound waves, understands the perfect mathematical relationship between them and condenses them down into one pitch with color. So the color of a particular instrument, whether it's a clarinet or a guitar or a trumpet or any kind of instrument you can imagine, a piano, a xylophone, um, whatever it is, the color of that instrument is determined by how loudly each of these little partials is vibrating and to what degree. That's what's gonna determine the color of the instrument. Um, so all of those frequencies are there. I'm just now, by silencing the lowest one, we allow the next one up to be heard. What your brain automatically does is it hears the lowest of those partials that are perfectly mathematically related, what we call the fundamental. And automatically hears that as the sort of true pitch of the note and all of the overtones as color of the note. And uh, if you have your guitar, you can actually go through and you can cause all of these to vibrate. You can do the X over 2, do X over 3 at the 7th fret, X over 4 at the 5th fret, X over 5. I'm going to turn up the volume so you can really hear them. X over 6, 7, 8, 9, you know. You can keep going basically into infinity. Um, now, I mentioned that they don't all vibrate at the same volume. Uh, let's take a second and let's talk about the way sound waves work because that's going to inform the entire, the entire thing of how this works. So um, hopefully you can see this over here. What we usually draw a sound wave as is um, we draw you know, a T like that to represent a Y axis and an X axis, and we tend to just draw a sound wave like this, okay? And um, there's a bunch of different parts to a wave. Um, we have the wavelength, which is how long the wave is as it, as it repeats. Um, we have the amplitude, which is how loud that frequency is, how loud that, that sound wave is. Um, and then we have the frequency, uh, which we measure in sound as hertz, which is um, cycles per second. And what hertz is, or what the frequency is, is how often it's repeating, how often um, it, within a given time period, what's called the period of the wave, how often that, uh, that sound wave is, is, uh, is repeating itself, how often it's going up and down across the x-axis. Um, so I mentioned that this frequency, fifth string on my guitar, is vibrating at 110 hertz. Okay. That means that 110 times every second, that sound wave is going up and down. Um, in music, we tend to think first of the frequency and amplitude. Those are the two things that we most concern ourselves with. We don't really think about the wavelength, how long the wave is, because the faster the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. So we only really need to measure one of those. Amplitude is the one that's independent. Amplitude is how far up and down over this x-axis the sound wave happens to go. The further away it goes, the louder it is. So amplitude you can think of as being equivalent to loudness, to energy. So the total energy of the wave is the amplitude and how quickly the wave is moving up and down. Higher the frequency, more energy. Higher the amplitude, more energy. Some combination of there equals is going to equal the, frequ the, the total energy of that frequency. Um, now, as we go through our harmonic series, something you'll notice is that they get quieter. And this is an electric instrument, so it's really helping me let you hear these really well as I crank up the volume, uh, the volume pop. Um, but on an acoustic instrument, you're going to hear them getting shorter and shorter. And you can do this with the piano, by the way. 
can reach in and touch the string in halfway and cause a harmonic to pop out. I've seen a couple of modern pieces that actually use it. Um, now these things get softer and softer as they go because there's less and less um, room for that little vibration to happen. Um, and if we were to plot it out on a graph, I know you guys were going into a music video with uh, ex expectations of graphs and sound waves. Uh, some of you were. So if you imagine, here's the X. The amplitude is uh, going to be our Y axis here, the amplitude. Um, the X length has the loudest frequency. And as you go down the um, X over 2, X over 3, the volume diminishes. So the amplitude gets lower and lower the further and further you divide the string up um, until eventually you're at a point where it's so quiet, it's negligible, and, and isn't really measurable. Um, and so when you strike a string, the total energy of what's there is actually kind of difficult to compute. You're going to have to use some calculus, which we're not going to do here, um, to actually compute the total energy of like a string vibrating. But suffice to say, as, as the frequencies, um, as you divide the, the string up into smaller and smaller bits, there's lower and lower energy. Um, the next thing that you should know is that as we go through the harmonic series, you should have noticed that the frequencies were getting higher and higher and higher. Um, what that means is that essentially the frequency of what's being generated by some partial of the, of the fundamental is always going to be some multiple of the frequency of the fundamental. So um, that A vibrating open is 110 hertz. If I touch the X over 2 length, it's actually vibrating at 220 hertz. And if I touch the X over 3 length, it's vibrating at 330 hertz. So the frequency of the divisions of the string, what we call the partials, is inversely related to how much you're dividing the string up. So if it's one quarter, it's four times the frequency. If it's one half, it's double the frequency. If it's one fifth, it's five times the frequency. And this generates what we call the overtone series. All these multiples of the frequency that add up to you hearing one pitch with a color. Um, and incidentally, the amplitude of all these different, um, all these different fractions uh, can be different, right? So you could have the X over three be a little bit louder and the X over two be a little bit quieter, and that will change the color of the instrument. A clarinet, for example, the X over two frequency isn't present because of the inner shape of the instrument. The shape on the inside is shaped like an hourglass, and that cuts the, um, cuts the X over two length out, cuts the first harmonic out, and that makes it sound kind of hollow. Uh, clarinet has a distinctive sound because you only are getting the odd frequencies. It also makes it have a little bit higher range when you start to play with those, those partials versus like a saxophone for a flute. And a saxophone has the X over two, and as a result, it has like a, a much kind of brighter, crisper sound. Um, the flute tends to have very low additional partials um, after the first couple of ones, which gives it a very brilliant sound um, and a, also a very somewhat hollow sound. So each instrument has its own um, concentration of these that gives it what we, what we call the timbre of the instrument, the color of the instrument. Um, hopefully this little introduction has been interesting for you. Next time we're going to continue this little bit here and we're going to do a little bit of math to figure out exactly how things are related and possibly expose some limitations with the Western, the current Western tuning system that we call um, equal temperament tuning. Um, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you want to see and what you want to hear. Um, I'm always happy to deliver if I can, and you guys uh, have a great day. Visit my websites down below, dbspress.com, davidbstewart.com, and uh, I look forward to seeing you next time.